Our next panel, or rather, our next, our next presentation is a video um, called How is the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force Approaching the Future of Security? It's our colleague Peter Singer, strategist and senior fellow in New America, professor of practice in the Future Security Initiative at ASU, interviewing uh, General Uchikura Hiroaki, the chief of staff of the Jap Japan Air Self-Defense Force. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce General Hiroaki Uchikura, Chief of Staff of Japan's Air Self-Defense Force. His roles and accomplishments over three decades of service range from piloting F-15 fighter jets to serving as Director General of the Defense Planning and Policy Department to Commander of Air Defense Command. But most important to me personally is that we were able to serve together when he was a military fellow in Washington, D.C. And I got to know Uchi both as a friend, but also witness uh, how he is an amazing researcher and writer, very appropriate to our gathering today. And during that time, he conducted uh, research and wrote a white paper on how interoperability is about more than just technology. It's about partnership. And I think that's a relevant lesson both for the conference, but also for the larger relationship between the US and Japan. General, thank you so much for joining us. We'll start now with a question um, from uh, what's going on in the world around us. General, what lessons are you taking from what we've observed in the conflict in Ukraine? I am General Chikura, Chief of Staff of Japan Air Self Defense Force for Koku Jetai. I'd like to express my gratitude to Dr. Singer, who invited me to this historic future security forum. I have cherished my relationship with him since I was a fellow at the Brookings Institution. It is my great honor to be here today on behalf of Koku Jetai. The views that are going to be expressed today are those of mine and do not reflect the official policy or position of Koku Jedi, Ministry of Defense, or the government of Japan. Let me briefly talk about the lessons learned from the situation in Ukraine from two perspectives. The first one is at the strategic level, and it is the importance of deterrence to discourage aggression and the ability to respond in case of a contingency. The biggest lesson that we have learned from Russia's aggression against Ukraine is that it is critical to maintain sufficient vigilance to restrain opponent actions. We now see that when a country with strong military capability forms the intention to launch an aggression, it is inherently difficult to gauge its intent from the outside and conditions under which a threat may materialize always exist. Also, while no nation alone can defend its own security, there is a renewed recognition of the importance of not only strengthening our own defense capabilities, but also enhancing interoperability, which includes the commonality of aircraft and weapons and the connectivity of network that enable cooperation at a higher level with the ally who have the intent and the capability to respond to invasion in a coordinated manner. Considering both deterrence and response perspectives, it is also necessary to reinforce cooperation and collaboration with the allies, like-minded countries and others. The second viewpoint is from an operational level, and it is the necessity of defense capabilities that can adapt to a new way of warfare. In the aggression against Ukraine, hybrid warfare has emerged with a combination of massive missile strikes by ballistic and cruise missiles, asymmetric attacks leveraging the space cyber and electromagnetic domains, and with a manned asset and information warfare. With this in mind, we have reached a recognition that it is urgent for us 
to build advanced integrated air and missile defense where we can combine kinetic and non-kinetic means appropriately. In the concept of IAMD, it is also vital to strengthen passive defense capabilities to mitigate damage and ensure functionality through dispersion, concealment, and camouflage, damage restoration, and others, as well as active defense capabilities, such as air defense and ballistic missile defense. When I participated in NATO exercise, Air Defender 23 in Germany in June, which focused on dispersed deployment, I exchanged views and shared this recognition with air chiefs from participating countries. General, as you look beyond you, other key trends that you observe shaping the future of security, and in particular, what scenario of the future might be the most challenging? I think there are two key trends. First, there is a global trend known as geopolitical competition. Looking at the Indo-Pacific region, where Japan is located, for example, there are a number of countries causing security concerns. Russia has launched an aggression against Ukraine and shaken the foundation of the international order despite its permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council. China continues to advance its unilateral changes to the status quo by force or such attempts in the East China Sea and South China Sea. North Korea escalates its activities, launches ballistic missiles at an unprecedented high frequency and uh, proceed with the development of nuclear weapons. Therefore, it is important for Japan in cooperation and collaboration with allied and like-minded countries and others to continue to demonstrate the intention and the capability to deter unilateral changes to the status quo by force and such attempts through our strategic alignment and the synergistic effects from our common efforts. Based upon this idea, the Koku Jedi has conducted bilateral, multilateral training with exercises with Australia, India, Germany, France, and Italy in the past year, with the Japan-US alliance as a cornerstone. The security of the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific are inseparable. This phrase clearly expresses the recent trend. The second trend is to view security as a comprehensive national power which links the major function of a country, such as democracy. Oh, I'm sorry. Such as diplomacy, intelligence, military affairs, and economy, which is abbreviated as DIME, to technological innovation. When it comes to diplomacy and intelligence, for instance, it is, it is critical to be able to communicate timely and accurate, accurate information through social media while discerning the authenticity of conflicting information. In terms of military, there is a greater significance of leveraging the space, cyber, and electromagnetic domains, as well as capabilities supported by state-of-art technologies, such as the use of unmanned systems and drones, in addition to traditional military power. From the key point of geopolitical competition, the most challenging scenario is when an opponent utilizes kinetic means such as A to AD as well as cognitive warfare with the goal of intentionally decoupling the cooperative and collaborative relationship 
between Japan and our ally and like-minded countries and others, thus attempting to take advantage of opportunity to carry out unilateral changes to the status quo by force and such attempts or at once. Thai, especially from a military perspective, presents a scenario where if the war fighting quietly begins in the space and cyber domains, and the C5 ISRT malfunctions due to unstable communications, significant loss of GPS positioning accuracy, etc., and existing assets are unable to respond in a timely and appropriate manner. Numerous missiles would be able to fly in and land, causing enormous human and material damage to the political and economic center of state. This would be the worst scenario caused by the negative effect from technological innovation. It used to be hypothetical, but now it turns out to be an operational reality, exemplified by the aggression against Ukraine, which is now widely viewed as an operational situation to be prepared for. General, as you look at these trends, you have a responsibility not only to respond to them, but also shape the force of tomorrow and 2040 from today. What capabilities might it have that it does not have now? Well, um, considering Koku Jedi's effort, I'd like to share three big changes that we are anticipating. The first change is the improvement of space oper operational capabilities. Japan's national defense strategy states that the Japan Air Safety Defense Force will be renamed to Japan Air and Space Safety Defense Force. Only three years have passed since the establishment of our first space unit, and it is still at its initial phase. I think it will possess stronger space capabilities by 2040. The second one is an enhancement of traditional air power to defend the air domain. Taking our fighter unit as an example, it is estimated that by 2040, we will operate approximately 150 F-35, including F-35B with stable capability, 70 upgraded F-15s, as well as next generation fighter aircraft, GCAP that we have currently developing in the UK and Italy. With these aircraft, Fokujetai, we have increased capability and flexibility, including the ability to operate standoff missiles. The third change is the progress in unmanned and automated systems. In accordance with the Defense Build-Up Program, Fokujetai will continue to promote unmanned asset defense capabilities. It is predicted that by 2040, in addition to the RQ4B already in place, we will be able to operate some unmanned aerial vehicles linked with fighter aircraft. We will also promote the automation of various sensors and command control systems, enabling Conclusion Dive to be more efficient and capable of performing more efficient with fewer personnel. First, regarding space operations, I predict that the Koku Jedi will possess its capability to carry out wide range of missions apart from space domain awareness, both on the ground and in space. Secondly, it is also expected when it comes to integrated air and missile defense, we will be able to respond effectively to hypersonic weapons and missiles that flies on irregular trajectories at low altitude. Thirdly, we anticipated that the Kokuji Dai would possess stand of defense capabilities 
including the capability to independently operate dynamic targeting, which the US military already possesses. Fourth, in order to prevent further attacks from an opponent by utilizing the standard defense capability, it is also expected that we will have counter strike capabilities to mount effective counter strike against the opponent. In each of those trends and capabilities, we see a variety of new technologies. General, um, what technologies do you see as being key to the future? Key technologies for the future will be AI, simulation using VR and AR, and database access technology. First, AI technologies is expected to be used in the military field that only to assist in command and decision making and to improve information processing capabilities, but also to be equipped with unmanned aerial vehicles and used in the cyber domain. Furthermore, generative AI represented by chat GDP is increasingly recognized as having a significant impact on social life. In addition, in order to win the battle where the combat situation will become even more rapid and complex in the future. It is necessary to make quicker and more accurate decisions than those of our opponents. AI plays a major role in improving the decision-making process itself, as well as makes it possible to build a man-on-the-loop system that allows humans to oversee the decision-making process. Second, Simulation technology using VR and IAR is becoming increasingly important as the complexity of combat situations makes it more difficult to create the same situation in actual training and exercise. High fidelity simulators not only enable mission reversals but also contribute to SDGs by reducing the number of flights using actual aircraft. Third, I believe that the technology to share sensitive information stored in databases with other military services and allies in real time is a critical technology as a range of utilization of passive sensors expands at an accelerating pace. Interoperability metrics are beginning to seek from network connectivity to database accessibility. General, I know as both a leader, but also as a writer, that you care deeply about the role of people in the organization. So what new uh, and different skills do you anticipate that military officers will need in this future? I think there are two skills that military officers will need in the future. First is a skill related to superiority in decision making. In order to control a battle where combat situations are becoming more rapid and complex, it is necessary to ensure superior decision making by having commanders or staff officers make appropriate decisions more quickly and more accurately than the opponent. Therefore, I think that the commanders who will make decisions in such an environment will need to acquire even more skills than they currently have to observe and orient information quickly and connect it to their decisions and their actions. If we look ahead to the day in the near future when frontline commanders will be using wearable devices such as smart glasses to take command, I believe that the skills required will become 
extra capability linked to IT literacy. Second is a skill related to mission command. In a situation where combat conditions are becoming more rapid and complex, it is possible that command and control may be cut off due to the jamming of communications. When a commander can grasp information sufficiently, detailed command in which detailed instructions are given to subordinate commanders for their actions in Sudan is suitable. On the other hand, when the war situation is uncertain and rapidly changing due to disruption of communications, it is appropriate to take mission command delegating decision making and operational execution to subordinate commanders in accordance with the situation. Therefore, I believe that officers will be required more than ever before to have the skills and the mental toughness to deeply understand their own duties, missions, and to be able to command in a timely and appropriate manner even without the instruction and order from their superiors. General, you have been um, very generous with your time and also speaking with us across uh, multiple time zones. We very much appreciate you joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you.